Good morning, everybody, and to those members of the public watching virtually. Right. Welcome to the Western. I'll start again. Good morning, everybody, and to those members of the public watching virtually, welcome to the Western and Southern Area Planning Committee today, Thursday, the 19th of October, 2023. My name is Councillor Jean Danseeth, Vice Chair of this committee. As the Chairman, Councillor Shortell, is absent, as Vice Chair, I will be acting in his place. I would like to welcome Councillor Belinda Rideout to the committee. Councillor Rideout is substituting for Councillor Shortell and has been duly appointed in accordance with the procedures set out in the Council's constitution. Councillor Rideout will not debate or vote on item 5A as she has not attended the site visit for this matter, but will otherwise participate in this meeting. The Constitution does not expressly provide for the election of an acting vice chair when the vice chair steps up. Therefore, in order to help in the smooth running of the meeting, I have invited Councillor Rideout to come and sit beside me. She is not a vice chair of this committee, but has kindly agreed to help me, and she will be keeping an eye on timings and which member is next due to speak. This will apply to all items on the agenda. The planning meeting is not a public meeting, but a meeting to which the public are invited. All attendees must comply with the ruling of the chair. They must not interrupt the meeting or cause undue disturbance. To support this, can I ask that all switch off your mobile phones or put them on silent for the duration of the meeting? This meeting is being live streamed and the recording will also be available to view on the website after the meeting. No fire alarm test is expected. If a fire alarm does sound, please leave the building immediately. We have two exits behind us and one to the over there. And assemble at the nearest fire assembly point. Can I remind everyone that when you are speaking, can you please introduce yourself for the benefit of the public watching and speak directly into the microphones so that you can be clearly heard and seen? I find when people put the microphone on and they turn their heads, they're not speaking directly into the mic and it can be a bit difficult to hear. We have four applications to determine today. The case officer will be invited to present the report and recommendations. Next, I will invite members of the public who have registered to speak to address the committee. Each speaker has three minutes and it will be timed. Following which, the committee members will be given an opportunity to ask questions of the officers and debate the application. I would like to invite the members and officers involved in today's meetings to switch their microphones on and introduce themselves, please. Starting with councillors, I think if we start from the back and move forward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Louis O'Leary from the ward of Little Warren Preston in Weymouth, which is in the southern and western area. Councillor Bill Pipe, Chairman, uh, representing the people of the Lichits and Upton. Councillor Nick Ireland, representing the people of Crossways Ward. 
Councillor Kelvin Clayton, Bridport Ward. Councillor Sarah Williams, Bridport Ward. Councillor Susan Cockin, representing Portland Ward. Councillor Kate Weller, representing White Regis and Rodwell. Thank you, members. And now, if our officers could do the same, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Tom Wilde, uh, Senior Planning Officer, Western and Southern Team. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Joanne Language Merritt, uh, Planning Officer. Good morning, Chair. Charlotte Loveridge, Planning Officer, Western and Southern Area. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Katrina Trevitt, Development Management Team Leader for the Southern and Western Area. Thank you for that. So, Agenda Item 1, Apologies. Um, so we've received apologies today from councillors Shortell, Bowell, Kimber and Worth, but we've got councillor Kimber joining us online as well. Sorry. Uh, we've also got councillor Rideout joining us as a substitute for councillor Shortell. Thank you, Josh. Do we have any declarations of interest? Councillor O'Leary. Uh, yes, on the item relating to Canberra Road in Littlemore, um, I will not be participating or voting on that as the land is owned by my mum's cousin. Um, so I don't know if I have to leave the room for that or if I can remain but not speak or take part in the debate. Thank you, Councillor O'Leary. Um, you will need to leave the room, um, though you may stay for the public speaking portion. Councillor Williams. Thank you. Um, on item 5A, I unfortunately did not make the visit. I did go and have a look yesterday, but the weather was so disgusting, I um, didn't manage to uh, visit all the viewpoints. So um, possibly I shouldn't take part in that debate. Thank you, Councillor Williams. You don't need to leave the room. We'll not be able to take part in the debate and not be able to vote on 5A. Thank you. Are there any other? Councillor Cocking. Um, as Councillor Williams has just said, so I didn't know whether I needed to say it now or later, but on Monday I did go and visit the, the, the site of 5A and I took in the information and the emails that were sent to me, so I was able to do all the viewpoints and have a really good look at the whole site and the surrounding area. So I am very familiar with the site, so I feel that I am fully informed that I will be able to take part, debate and vote on that application. Thank you for that, Councillor Cocking. That's fine. <sighs> Item number three, to agree and sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 7th of September. And I will, if you all agree, I will sign as chair. Are you content? Yeah? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Public item number four, public participation. Members of the public, and it's nice to see so many of you here today, who are registered to speak, you will be given the opportunity, you can either speak now and use your three minutes, or you can wait until the item has been presented by the case officer. Is there anyone that would like to speak now? You'd all prefer after the case officer's presentation. That's fine, thank you. We're now on to item five, planning applications. 5A is P 
FUL 2023-00384, Highlands End Holiday Park, Highlands End EEP, EEP, that's it, DT66AR. This application will be introduced by Case Officer Thomas Wilde. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, members. If we could just um, confirm who will be um, participating in this item. So I have a list of the members who attended the site visit. That is Councillor Dunseith, Councillor Weller, Councillor Kimber, Councillor Island, Councillor Pipe, and Councillor Clayton. Councillor Williams has already made her statement that she will not be participating or voting on this item. Um, Councillor Cocking has made her own arrangements and has made a statement. So uh, by my calculations, that's just Councillor O'Leary. Just for the benefit of um, our online viewers, uh, Councillor O'Leary will not be participating or voting on this matter. Yes, Councillor. Yes, Councillor Ireland. So, Joe, it's, uh, anybody listening might think that Councillor Kimber can take part, but he's not actually in the chamber, so I'm assuming he can't vote. It's probably worth clarifying that. Good point. Councillor Kimber cannot vote on this item. No. So Councillor Kimber, not being in the chamber, cannot speak and cannot vote on item 5A. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the application is reference PFUL 2023-00384. The installation of 300 uh, ground-mounted photovoltaic solar panels to provide carbon-free electricity for the park at Highlands End Holiday Park, EAP. Um, this is being referred back to the committee following the, uh, the vote last, uh, last time round to defer for, for, the, uh, for a site visit. Um, this slide shows the site location um, in, outlined in red. This is the application location plan outlined in red. Uh, the long section of the red line, um, if I just turn my pointer on, long section of red line um, to the northern part of the site is, shows the access which should be used uh, for construction. Um, the the um, area where the panels would be would be in this southern um, part of the site. Um, this is zoomed in, showing, um, showing that southern area um, in, in the context of the aerial photography. We have the Holiday Park um, on the east of the site with uh, Eat Village to the west. Um, the, the land levels, uh, it's not in, in, immediately obvious from this slide um, to being an aerial photograph, but the land levels do rise relatively steeply um, towards the east and towards the north. Um, towards the Holiday Park, um, and members will have seen that when they when they visited the site. Um, the uh, this slide shows the rights of way network in the area. There are quite a a, a number of rights of way, uh, with the footpath shown in the pinkish colour and the bridleway shown in yellow. Um, so we have including footpaths running along the southern boundary of the site. Um, along here we have the southwest coast path, and there's a number of bridleways and footpaths extending into the countryside beyond. Um, this slide shows uh, the landscape and heritage constraints in the vicinity of the site. Um, first to mention, we have the area of outstanding natural beauty designation, which um, does wash over the whole of the, um, the area. So it, is, it, it basically covers ev everything on this slide. Um, we have EAP conservation area in the, to the west of the site here. Um, in this uh, darker purplish colour. The lighter blue shading is the Heritage Coast designation, and then we have the World Heritage Site further to the south. Uh, 
Um, the proposed development um, is comprised of 300 solar panels in seven tables they've been referred to. So each, each one of these blocks of panels is, is what's being referred to as a table. Um, we have a total output of, the, uh, of the, the installation of 198 kilowatts, which equates to 298 megawatt hours of electricity per year. Um, and then just to um, oh, oh, just to point out on this, this this slide does show the contour lines for the um, for the, the land levels. So showing that the the site um, the installation straddles the 45 meter AOD line um, with the land levels rising to 50 55 meters and beyond to the north and east. Uh, we have a just to provide some context, uh, an, an application was previously considered and refused on this site for a, a slightly larger installation. Um, so this was the previously refused scheme showing the installation um, of uh, on, on uh, five tables um, extending slightly further up, to, up the hill. Uh, that was refused earlier on, on landscape and heritage grounds. Um, the slide we have here shows the um, proposed landscaping for the scheme. Um, that includes orchard planting, so that each, each green dot is indicative of a, an orchard tree, and then um, native hedgerow planting along this western boundary and along the southern boundary of the field. Um, just to note that the, um, the landscaping proposals do sit outside of the red line uh, boundary of the application, but are within the applicant's ownership and the blue line boundary. Uh, main issues um, to be considered um, as part of the proposals, uh, we have the principle of development um, and the provision of renewable energy is supported by local and national policies, um, policy COM10 of the, um, of the local plan, CC4 of the neighbourhood plan and paragraph 158 of the national planning policy frameworks. Um, these are considered to be public benefits um, in providing carbon-free electricity, um, and that is something that, that is afforded weight in the planning balance in light of the Council's declared climate emergency. Um, the, the, however, it is worth noting that the support provided by the policies is only insofar as the impacts of the development in other respects can be success, successfully mitigated or, or assimilated. Um, in respect of, of amenity uh, of neighbours, uh, officers' view is that it's not considered that there would be any harmful impacts of the proposals um, following installation. Um, the, the, the installation is a, a relatively low-key, low-intensity uh, impact. Um, the, the impacts are associated with the presence, not necessarily comings and goings, or there's no, there's no potential for overlooking, etc. Um, and in terms of biodiversity, um, there, there has been a biodiversity plan agreed with the natural environment team, uh, which, which proposes um, biodiversity net gain across the site through the hedgerow creation and confirms that there would not be any harm to any protected species. Um, moving on to the um, more significant um, issues we, we, we're facing with this application, we, we're considering the landscape impacts. Um, as we've seen, the site is located within the area of outstanding natural beauty and the heritage coast. Um, and the proposal um, has been assessed as resulting in harmful impacts upon the landscape by landscape officers um, and the area of outstanding natural beauty team. Um, the, and the, um, it's considered that the submissions by the applicant have failed to, also failed to demonstrate that there are, aren't any, sorry, failed to demonstrate that there are not any alternative sites to that could deliver the development without leading to the same level of harm. There's a lot of negatives in that um, statement, but um, basically there's a level of doubt in, in the, in the um, submission as to whether the development could be achieved elsewhere without leading to the same level of harm. Um, and specifically, uh, just worth mentioning that the landscape officer has, has been critical of the, the applicant's submission in, in providing only one visualization of the scheme um, which uh, considers a distant viewpoint, it doesn't consider the, the closer viewpoints to the site which would be more significantly affected and those, those are some of the viewpoints that members will have seen um, during the, the site visit. 
Um, just covering the site visit is just a reminder for members of the viewpoints which we which we looked at on the site. Um, the the plan, uh, the red dotted line here shows the the, the route that we walked uh, from the entrance to the holiday park, through the holiday park, just pointing out the point of connection to to the electrical grid for the park here. Um, down the southwest coast path, stopping um, at a couple of points at the, so the southwest coast path and the, the car park before going back up through the village to these closer viewpoints on the, the footpath on the southern boundary of the site. Um, and then, then before going up to the, the longer range of viewpoints at Downhouse Farm and then the viewpoints from the western um, side of the, of, of the village on the southwest coast path. Um, so just walking some photos, just, just going through some of those viewpoints, just to remind members of, of what will have, will have been seen on the site. The, this photo is from the southern boundary um, of the site along the footpath, uh, showing the, the, um, the, the fields in which the, the, the panels will be installed uh, in this part of the site here. The panels will be installed in the, the bottom part of the site, so relatively close to this, this fence line. Um, and then would extend there's a there's a it's not really visible on this this image but there is a uh, a fence a, a post and rail a post and wire fence which which cross which separates the field and and the the panels would be located this side of the fence um, this is looking back in the opposite direction you can see that the post and wire fence are referred to there again the panels located in this this part of the site here um, and with with the proposed landscaping either side with, with hedgerows there. We have the, uh, this view just shows further along that same footpath. Um, members recall that the, the, the footpath does rise quite steeply from the site, um, following the land level, uh, land level rises towards the holiday park itself, and then just affords the views back towards the site, which are these elevated views. And I think this just um, illustrates the concerns over mitigating the landscape impacts from these, these closer range viewpoints, given that the views avail are available from elevated positions. So any views are, are down onto the, the panels rather than across the landscape uh, where, where mitigation planting is more effective. Uh, and again, this just shows that elevated viewpoint looking back. Um, we, we have some screening here with, with some, some tree planting that has been carried out, but members will recall um, there is a viewpoint a, a few paces um, to the right of the, the, this vantage point, which um, which provides a much clearer view of the site, um, and again illustrating the, the difficulty of, of mitigating the um, the views from those locations. Uh, we have the um, this is a view from the southwest coast path um, back towards the site. Again, we have the the holiday park on the the top of the hill here, the field. Um, in the set behind the chalets, and then the, the installation will be at the bottom end of the field. Um, as noted at this point, uh, there's, there's screening, some screening is provided by the tree line at the bottom of the field. It's just worth noting that the trees that provide that screening are outside of the application site, um, and they're also outside of the applicant's ownership, um, as indicated through the application. So they're, the, that those can't be controlled through the through the application. Um, this is the longer range viewpoint that we picked up from Downhouse Farm. We have the um, holiday, again the holiday park on the, the the ridge line here, the field where the panels will be located in the middle distance, um, and then Eep Village just in just sitting slightly above where we have this. Um, Shepherd's Hut uh, in this location. So again, the the um, the panels will be at the bottom end edge of the field, and I think we we observed on site that um, the the top edge of the the installation would be visible in this longer range viewpoint. Um, and this is just an alternative view of of a sim the similar vantage point from Downhouse Lane. Once again, we have the. Um, the, the, the holiday park at the, the, the ridge, the field, and the, the point of the installation at the bottom here. 
Um, I just wanted to cover off the point about the um, the alternative, the, the provision of alternative sites and consideration of those. Um, the applicant submissions um, considered uh, an alternative site, uh, which is outlined in blue on this uh, plan, which is referred to as site B, with the application site site A in red. Um, the, the alternative site was discounted primarily on the basis of its um, its land, land levels falling away to the north, um, and also difficulties in cable routing to to, con to connect into the the site's grid. Um, however, it's not it wasn't considered to be clear from the submissions how how the two options were arrived at, um, given the quite extensive land holding available. Um, there is also the, the point that the, the constraints um, to which the, the, the two sites are, are subject, um, the application site, as we've seen previously, it's, it is close to the conservation area. Um, it's within the Heritage Coast designation, um, as well as the AOMB designation, whereas the um, site B um, has lesser constraint um, directly upon it. It's, it's, it's not within the Heritage Coast designation, um, and it is located further from the, the, um, the conservation area with the, the, the holiday park itself providing a, a physical um, barrier sitting between it and the, the, um, the, the, the potential site installation. Um, the location adjacent to the, um, the conservation area requires then therefore also consideration to be given to conservation and heritage impacts. Um, and as submitted, it is considered that the proposals are um, considered to cause less than substantial harm to the setting of the EAP conservation area. Um, in their consultation response, the conservation officer did offer some suggested amendments which, in their view, would reduce the level of harm to a point which could potentially have been outweighed by the public benefits of the scheme. Um, they would, they, their, their, their indication was that this would still be harm, but that, that harm would be lesser. Um, and and that, those changes would have involved the removal of the top row of panels and specifying panels with low ref reflectivity and black surrounds. Um, however, given the um, councillor's findings, uh, sorry, officer's findings in respect of the landscape impacts and visual impacts of the scheme, um, amend amendments were not sought in this, in this instance. Um, that leads us on to the planning balance uh, which we have to consider. We have um, the benefits of the scheme, uh, principally the provision of the renewable energy um, that the scheme would provide and the associated reduction in CO2 emissions. As I said, we, we, can, affo we can afford that weight as a public benefit given that the, account the council has declared a uh, climate emergency. Um, uh, however, these, need these do need to be weighed against the, um, the harm that has been identified we have the less than substantial harm to the setting of the EAP conservation area, which um, there is a, a statutory requirement um, for uh, regard to be, to be had to the, the um, desirability of preserving and enhancing that conservation area. Um, and national policy indicates that great weight should be given to its conservation. Um, and also um, the harmful impacts on the landscape and special character of the Dorset area of outstanding natural beauty um, and the West Dorset Heritage Coast, which, um, as, as we've heard, uh, we don't consider that those impacts can be adequately mitigated on this site. Um, and also, it's not been adequately demonstrated that there are no alternative sites to accommodate the installation in a way that would have lesser impact on these, um, these designated designations. Um, therefore, uh, officer's recommendation is that the committee is, uh, refuses planning permission for the reasons which are set out on screen, um, which are uh, reason one relates to the uh, landscape impacts of the development on the area of outstanding natural beauty, and reason number two relates to the uh, impacts upon the EAP conservation area and less than substantial harm that would be caused. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Thomas. And now we come to public speakers. Do we have Emma Freud? You're here. Right. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to express our thanks to those of you who attended the site visit last week. You all should now have also received an expert's report. 
On behalf of concerned residents, as evidenced by the large numbers of informed objections that have been submitted against this proposal, we wish to reinforce the Council's two reasons for refusal. The harmful impact upon the Dorset AOMB and the harmful impact upon the historic environment in the form of Lower Eep Conservation Area and St Peter's Church. The National Planning Policy Framework, NPPF, advises that great weight must be given to conserving and enhancing areas of outstanding natural beauty and to the conservation of the historic environment. Planning case law confirms that the failure of local planning to demonstrate that great weight has been given to the conservation of an AONB or elements of the historic environment is a ground for judicial review. This can lead to any approval that may have been granted being quashed. You have before you a recommendation to refuse this application. We wholly support that recommendation as we find it to be well informed and to be policy compliant. It accords with the decision of the Council to refuse to grant planning permission for the 2021 application for an extremely similar proposal for solar panels on this site. There are no material reasons not to find that the decision to refuse the application in 2021 is still appropriate and correct. There have been no changes in planning policy or changes in the need to protect the AONB and the historic environment, nor significant material changes to the detail of the proposal. There is no evidence that the solar array cannot be sited elsewhere, away from the conservation area. There is no evidence that energy savings cannot be achieved in any other ways at the holiday park. In accordance with the recommendation of your professional officer, we are asked to support the, we are asked to support the refusal of this application on the grounds of unjustified harm to the AOMB and to Lower Eep Conservation Area and St Peter's Church. We will now provide you with further evidence of the failure of the proposal to comply with policy that seeks to conserve the AOMB landscape and the historic environment. Have you finished? That's you're finished. Thank you very much. And um, the second speaker is Mervyn Ashford. You have three minutes. Good morning. The proposed development, as confirmed in the applicant's landscape and visual impact assessment, will impact on the Dorset AONB and the Heritage Coast. The applicant's LVIA states that the appearance of the array in the landscape is acceptable as it will be seen with the holiday park and other incongruous infrastructure. This is nonsense. If this argument was upheld, where would it end? Furthermore, the array is far from being close to the holiday park. It is set away from it, adjacent to the conservation area and in the open countryside setting of the parish church. It will extend incongruous structures into undeveloped countryside. Site B is worthy of further consideration, and there are almost certainly other sites as well. In addition to being within the AONB, the, pro the proposed array will impact upon the heritage coast. The NPPF states that within areas defined as heritage coast, planning policies and de decisions should be consistent with the special character of the area and the importance of its conservation. Those of you who attended the site visit would have witnessed that for yourselves. This solar array is plainly not consistent with the conservation of the heritage coast. The NPPF states that great weight should be given to the conserving and enhancing the landscape and scenic beauty of areas of outstanding natural beauty. 
Allowing this solar array on the basis that there is already harm in this part of the AONB is wholly against this policy. For you to grant permission for this proposal where it is clear to us and your officers and is even stated by the applicant's landscape consultants to be apparent in the AONB and where the applicant acknowledges that it is a sensitive landscape would be to grant a consent that is wholly against local and national policy and would evidently place the council at risk of judicial review and the subsequent quashing of the approval. We encourage you to appreciate the clear evidence against this application and to support the recommendation of your professional planning officers to refuse this application as you did correctly in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pipe. And now it's the third speaker is Charlotte Boys. Have I have I pronounced that correctly? Thank you. You have three minutes, Charlotte. In terms of the impact of the proposal upon the historic environment, the applicant appears to be totally unaware of the presence of the proposal adjacent to Lower Eep Conservation Area. The applicant's landscape assessment states that Bridport is the closest conservation area. This is patently inaccurate. If the Lower Eep conservation area was not appreciated in the assessing the impact of the proposal, how can it have been designed to conserve that conservation area? We're also disappointed that neither the applicant nor the council's conservation officer have considered the impact of the proposal upon St. Peter's Church, a 19th century chapel of ease of great local architecture and historic importance which we feel should be treated as a non-designated heritage asset. The applicant did not submit a heritage appraisal and impact assessment. Also, the council's conservation officer is not considered to have fully assessed the impact of the proposal upon the historic environment. An assessment commissioned by concerned residents has been undertaken by a qualified and experienced heritage planning consultant who finds that the impact of the proposal upon Lower Eep Conservation Area and upon St. Peter's Church is not policy compliant. The policy is not found to have been properly informed by a heritage appraisal. The contribution that the underdeveloped setting of the conservation area and the church makes the heritage asset significance is found to have been understated and not fully understood. The proposal for the solar array is found not to have clear and convincing justification. There is no evidence that it has to go where it is proposed, nor that the energy savings cannot be achieved in other ways. The assessment concludes that due to the great weight that must be given to the conservation of the historic environment, that the low level of public benefit offered by the proposal is not outweighed by the harm caused the conservation area and St. Peter's Church. Planning case law in the Forcefield case against Seven Oaks Council, who had approved an affordable housing application in a conservation area and was quashed at a judicial review due to the council not having consciously made a presumption in favor of the conservation of the historic environment. Your officers have rightly stated that the need to conserve the historic environment is greater than the need to provide this solar array, and we're therefore encouraging you to support the informed and correct recommendation of your professional officers and to determine the application in accordance with local and national planning policy and please to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you. We now have... Mr. Carthy and Cox to speak. You have three minutes between you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, also, thank you to the members for taking the time to carry out a site inspection and give themselves the opportunity to assess the various viewpoints of the likely impact on the AOMB and perhaps agree that we have proposed the most inconspicuous location for the panels to give a practical and effective connection to the existing transformer. 
While the coastal path with its spectacular views remain unaffected, we acknowledge that users of the adjacent footpaths will initially have a view of the panels, but in mitigation, new screen hedging is proposed together with orchard planting. These two paths are functional, providing access rather than views, and the installation will show that we are investing to make the, the, the business sustainable to achieve the government's objective of net zero. Listening to the landscape's officer's comments, we omitted new fences and hedging across the arrays. To overcome this, we were prepared to re-establish an historical hedgerow to provide screening and increase wildlife habitat and biodiversity. Having visited the site, members are now able to take an objective view that the limited impact upon the OMB is outweighed by the significant benefits that the proposal will bring in the fight against climate change and the sustainability of a coastal and rural business. The Council's Climate Action Plan set out in 16 actions under four headings. One, to maximise opportunities for clean growth in Dorset and encourage investment in green jobs and business. Two, turning Dorset into a low-carbon tourist destination. Three, increase resilience on our local economy. And four, support Dorset businesses to become energy and resource efficient and to restore renewable energy. Our proposal is in line with these objectives and taking a carbon saving of 47,000 kilograms annually and bringing our business closer to net zero. Surely there can be few doubters now that the serious action is required to limit climate change after worldwide extreme flooding, wildfires, record high temperatures, reducing sea ice and disappearing glaciers. In the future, when the panels are dismantled due to changes in energy and energy generation, our legacy to my grandchildren will be that we stood up and contributed to the challenge. From the holiday park, the site has the appearance of being contained within the built fabric of the village in a secluded hollow immediately adjacent to dwellings outside of the conservation area. We do not believe the site and conservation area can be viewed in the same context from any public path. The conservation officer has confirmed that the scheme will be acceptable with some amendments. After carefully reconsidering any likely impact, we still believe it to be negligible and we would, of course, be willing to work with the Conservation Officer to further enhance the proposed landscaping. I very much hope that approval will be granted and I'm sure that any remaining concerns of members and officers may still have, after visiting the site, can be resolved by acceptable planning conditions. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. The planning officer to respond to any comments made by the speakers. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, just a few points, uh, if I may. Um, references made to the um, ex experts' report that has been commissioned by um, neighbouring residents. Uh, that was submitted to the council on late on Tuesday and it should have been circulated to members with the update sheet when it came around yesterday. So hopefully members have had a had a chance to review that. Um, I think it's, it's just worth mentioning that ultimately doesn't change the recommendation of officers, which is to refuse based upon the harm that has been identified to the um, to, to the heritage assets as well as the the landscape impacts of the scheme. Um, so it, it ultimately, while, while that provides additional um, commentary and context in in respect of the the the, the proposals, it doesn't change the um, the overall recommendation. Um, the the point the point was made about the reference to St Peter's Church um, that is considered to be a, a non designated heritage asset. Um, national planning policy indicates that in in such circumstances, a balanced judgment is required by um, by, by the decision makers um, in in this case members um, of the the harm versus any any benefits of the scheme. Um, there was also um, just uh, did find, yeah just finally a point was made about the um, by the applicant about the um, comments from the conservation officer um, with the amendments making the scheme acceptable. Um, I just wanted to clarify that the the conservation officer's comments indicated that their amendments that the that their indication was that the amendments would still result in harm to the setting of the conservation area but the harm would be reduced by those amendments um, and that would affect affect the planning balance ultimately because um, the, the 
there would be less harm to weigh against the public benefits of the scheme. So that, that was their view, and, and that by reducing that level of harm, the, the, um, it, it may reduce it to a level where the public benefits were able to outweigh that harm. Um, but as I said, that those, those amendments were, weren't sought on, in this instance due to the, to the wider landscape concerns that were held. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thomas. We now open the discussion to committee members. Can you please state your name when you put your mic on for the benefit of people watching? Thank you. Councillor Pipe. Councillor Pipe, Lichitz and Upton. Are these just technical questions, Chairman, or are you just opening the debate fully? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. You can, you can ask questions and basically debate if it follows on logically, rather than having a strict definition of technical questions. But if you have a question, if you could front load it, Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Still Councillor Pipe. Uh, has, has the applicant indicated at all that he's prepared to adopt the two uh, suggestions uh, to, to lessen the, the impact uh, of, of the array in, 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 the, in the bottom field at all? Um, I think there has been indication that, that those would be considered um, I think I'm right in saying that, but as I said, the, 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 we, haven't, we haven't invited the submission of those because of those wider landscape impacts and the, the, the ongoing view that the, ultimately the landscape impacts of the scheme can't be adequately mitigated in this instance. Are you content with that, Councillor Pipe? Councillor Ireland. Yeah, thank you. I've got a couple of questions. That's probably easier just to take each one at, in, as I say them, I guess. Um, I'm just, I'd am just like to have a bit more definition of what the Heritage Coast de designation is. It, it seems to be in, lumped in with AOMB, but obviously isn't the same, or is it the same? Or what, what, what basically are the limitations associated with Heritage Coast as opposed to AOMB? So. Uh, it, it's an additional um, designation which applies to the, the coastal areas, the undeveloped coastal areas um, to the south south of, of um, Dorset, uh, and the qualities that are associated with it are, are its undeveloped nature, effectively. So it is it is a an additional designation as well as the the AOMB designation. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understood that really. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so there was mention, um, so I'm slightly confused about the document we all received yesterday. I, I didn't read it till last night because I, I work and I have other things to do. Um, I read it twice and I read it again this morning. I, I, I guess I have a question for Hannah and Massey. Um, you know, the deadlines for planning applications, consultations, things have to be submitted. So how, how, do, how does this get around it? And we suddenly get lumped with 12 pages, which is quite complex, makes lots of assertions, some of which I'm, I'm going to challenge maybe. Um, how much weight should we be applying to it? Because um, it hasn't really been mentioned other than by Mr. Wild just recently. It wasn't mentioned in his report. How much weight should we apply to it? And, and how can we, well, I'm going to challenge some of the assertions. But. Thank you for that, Councillor Ireland. Um, Hannah will now reply. Thank you, Chair. Um, my understanding, um, though I have not read the um, report in, in, in detail myself, is that it did not fundamentally change the officer's recommendation. And so... It, Are you happy with that, Councillor Ireland? Are you content? Or would you like? Okay, right, okay. Well, I, you know, I, I think why would we sent it in the first place if it makes no difference? Um, should we be bothered reading it? Does it matter if we've read it um, to, the, you know, to our, our debate here? Are we discounted if we don't, haven't read it? I, anyway, um, 
I'll go on to non-designated. There's, there's mention in the, that document in particular that the church is non-designated. So is there actually a legal definition of non-designated, or is it something that somebody says, well, it's not a designated heritage asset, but we think it should be? Or is somebody actually saying it is non-designated, and if it is a legal definition, how does that apply? Because, you know, having read the document yesterday, it mentions numerous times that perhaps our officers, um, in particular the conservation officer, hasn't done their job properly, perhaps, in that they didn't consider the non-heritage asset. Yet, if you look at the, the quotes in that document from the MPPF, all the quotes say they need to look at designated heritage assets. So did the conservation officer need to look at the non heritage designated asset? Does it make a difference to the outcome? Um, so if I could respond to your first point about the, the document that was received. Um, essentially, any re representations that are made up until the, the point at which an application is determined need to be considered. Um, the, the deadlines that we set um, which are the 21-day consultation period, are effectively, they effectively set the earliest point at which the council can lawfully determine a planning application um, through, because we have to give a minimum consultation period, but we still um, have to take into consideration comments that have been that received up until the decision is made. Um, in terms of non-designated heritage assets, um, they that, that it's a slightly open-ended term. Um, they can be any any heritage asset that doesn't meet the criteria for statutory listing, but is considered by officers to have some value in heritage terms. Um, they, they, there isn't a list of them as such, um, because the, by their very nature they are non-designated, so they... they, they they don't have that, that nature, but um, in, in this case, the church is, is recognised. It, it's within the conservation area, and it's, the conservation area boundaries are specifically drawn to include the church, um, so, so it is considered a, a non-designated heritage asset on, on that basis. So what you just said is that Dorset Council considers the church as a non-designated heritage asset in this example. Okay, um, and I'd just like to comment on the... The surprising news that we can anybody can put in comments against a planning application any time, any place, anywhere. Um, as a parish councillor, I know my parish council struggles sometimes to meet the deadlines. So I guess we can potentially risk missing them, and you'll still consider the, the consultations. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Councillor Ireland. Uh, would anyone else like to speak? Councillor Clayton. Councillor Kelvin Clayton, Bridport. Um, this isn't a question. It's me trying to get my thoughts clear on this. Every time we have to do with this assessment of harm, I struggle because there is such a high degree of subjectivity involved. Um, I went on the site visit, and from my perspective, and I stress my perspective, I failed to see any harmful um, impacts on the landscape. Yes, you could see it, but the sight of it was absolutely minimal. Um, coupled with that, I'm, I'm also conscious that we had some training a couple of weeks back from Heritage Inspectorate. And I've got a quote here, he said, and you can afford to be quite generous in your definition of public benefit. Again, a very subjective balance between harm and public benefit. So from my perspective, I think the benefits of uh, renewable energy generation against the absolute, to my perspective, minimal impact on the uh, visual aspect, um, I think I'm inclined to, to be in favor of um, approving the application. Thank you, Councillor Clayton. Is that a proposal? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to make that a, pro, um, a proposal that we 
approve the application. Uh, Councillor Pipe, the Lichit Synopsis, and I'm quite happy to second that, Chairman. Um, right. Uh, and are you happy that um, the reasons given outweigh the harm, the public benefit? Could you comment, please? After all, the officer's recommendation is to refuse, so your decision is going against the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, those proposing and seconding um, a motion to potentially approve need to be very clear for their reasons for doing so. Um, I know Councillor Clayson obviously considers that there was going to be um, minimal harm to the heritage asset. I kind of need to be clear about what heritage asset he's considering there, presuming the conservation area and the setting of the non-designated heritage asset at the church and limited visual impact. Um, I assume that's in respect to both the A and B and the heritage coast and that you're saying the public benefits outweigh that. You'd need to be very clear about identifying what those public benefits would are that would outweigh those, what you've identified as minimal impacts. Um, in terms of heritage assets, the test is if you consider that the development would have less than substantial harm on the character of the conservation area and its appearance and the sort of setting of that non heritage asset, there needs to be a quantity of public benefits that outweigh that less than substantial harm. So that's what we just need to be clear about. Yes, if I've got this right, there's a presumption in favour of sustainable development. There are a presumption in favour of renewable energy generation, MPPF 158. If there are less than significant harm to the heritage area or the impact on the, on the coast, AONB, Jurassic Coast, outweighed by the public benefit, I think that less than substantial harm is minimal harm and is more than outweighed by the public benefit. Um, would you need some time to prepare conditions? Yes, you would. Thank you, Chair. So we're going to have to adjourn now for 10 minutes. So we're going to adjourn. Thank you.
see how I feel. So we're now back. Um, and could you go through the wording that you've come up with, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, so it would be to delegate authority to the Head of Planning and Service Manager for Development Management and Enforcement to grant planning permission subject to planning conditions the wording of which will have first been agreed by the vice chair who is acting as chair today in accordance with the following matters to be conditioned. So the first condition will be our standard um, three year condition we have to put on any plan permission for implementation within three years. There would be then be the approved plans list condition where we would list the plan numbers out in full, etc. A condition requiring the implementation of the biodiversity um, mitigation plan and scheme. The next condition would be a construction traffic management plan um, just to basically retain control over the routing and details of the construction traffic. 
Uh, then there'll be a condition about the submission of the soft landscaping and planting scheme, because we saw on the plans that there's some orchard planting and hedgerow planting proposed. So it'd be requiring the full details of that, implementing implementation in the planting season and its maintenance for five years thereafter. Um, a condition that we put on generally for solar development is that the um, solar panel installation would be removed after 40 years. That's generally the accepted period for these kinds of solar installation developments currently in the lifetime for the panels. And at that point, the agricultural land would be restored. And then the final condition was about no flood lighting or security lighting unless details have first been approved with us. It's not been indicated to us that there would be any lighting, but we'd want to assure that that was fully controlled um, should that be the case. Um, and just to clarify, Councillor Clayton made reference to paragraph 158 of the MPPF, which states um, approve, the application, approve an application for renewable if its impacts are acceptable. So we've taken that, that on the basis that you've identified less than substantial harm outweighed by the public benefit, you consider the impacts are acceptable and therefore there is a sort of presumption in accordance with power 158B of the MPPF. Councillor Clayton, are you happy with those form of words? Yes, Chair, I am. Thank you. Councillor Pipe, are you content? Yes. Right, thank you. We have a proposal and it has been seconded, but we still have uh, members who wish to speak. So I think we have Councillor Ireland and then after Councillor Weller. Councillor Ireland. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Nick Ireland, Crossways. Um, I'd like to thank the officers for the, the site visit because I found it really, really useful. Um, and you know, when I got home, you know, I, 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 I basically couldn't find any, in my own mind, in my view, any harm at all. Um, I, I've run along that coast quite a bit. I walk along it occasionally. Um, and when we were at the viewpoint, I was thinking, you know, would I even notice it? And the answer was no. I'm, you know. I'm afraid the, the obvious thing that you notice is the holiday park, um, and there's absolutely obviously nothing they can do about that. Um, and that's a, that's a history. So I I didn't see any harm at all, and I agree with my colleague Councillor Clayton that you know it, it seems per, fairly acceptable to me. It's not in the conservation area. You literally couldn't see it anywhere unless you were walking on the path next to it. And I guess with the the soft planting, when you go up slightly towards the the holiday farm and turn it back, you probably won't see it again much there. So I, I agree with his proposal, and um, I guess we keep mentioning AOMB, but we've approved solar panels in AOMB before. A lot of Dorset is AOMB, um, and you could argue that you know it's, it's not being destroyed; um, it's going to be restored. It's temporary, and you know you could argue almost some some way the land is actually being preserved; it's not being destroyed for anything else. It, it's under panels, um, so I'm going to support this proposal. Thank you, Councillor Ireland. Councillor Weller. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. I don't want to spin this out particularly now, um, but I would just like to say that um, I believe there has been significant change from the previous applications. Um, one of the objectors said that there wasn't any change, but there is. Um, in the intervening years, uh, the, we've had rising concerns on climate change, and we have declared a climate emergency, if we mean that seriously, we have to regard that seriously. Um, like my colleagues, I couldn't see the site from the heritage path. I couldn't see any significant harm personally. Um, and I thank the officers for rewording that. I, I, I think they've done a, a very good job with that. And, and I, I would be supporting. Councillor Weller. Thank you, Councillor Weller. Councillor Cocking, do you have any comments or anything you'd like to say as you have done the site visit? No, I have listened um, to the officers and I have listened to my fellow councillors and I, I, I've been in very two minds about it. But now that I've actually seen the conditions, because some of it was I was worried about the landscaping and the hedgerow and everything like that. Um, and, um, and I did go and visit it, and it's very beautiful, but as other councillors said, we, you know, we are trying to make renewable energies um, a forefront for the council, um, and now with those new conditions on it, I, I would be happy to support um, the acceptance 
of the application. Thank you, Councillor Cocking. So we have a proposer, we have a seconder. Do councillors have any other comments they would like to make? Are we ready for the vote? Are you content with, with the um, recommendation as it now stands, complete with its conditions? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Um. So the vote, the officer's recommendation is that we reject this and you seem of a mind to hmm, accept it. Is that correct? Right, that's fine. So if we could go to the vote then, all those in favour of the reworded recommendation to accept. Thank you. So the vote has just been taken, and it was unanimous, to accept the proposal to let the solar arrays go ahead, and rejecting the original officer's recommendation to refuse. You have all voted to accept the new recommendation. Have I got that right? Thank you. We'll just allow a few moments for change of officers and public speakers. Right, committee. Item 5B, PRES stroke 2023 stroke 03059, land to the rear of 34, 36A Canberra Road, Weymouth. And the officer introducing it is, will be Joe Langrish Merritt. Over to you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the application is P forward slash RES forward slash 2023 forward slash 03059. Now, before I start my presentation, I'd just like to make members aware that we received an amended plan after the committee reports have been prepared, and I'll be sharing this with you today. Um, it has been circulated as part of the updates. Um, there were only very minor changes to the plan, um, such as cycle parking, tactile paving, and the details of the materials have been added. However, I'll explain it as I go through my presentation, and I have reflected the amended plans in the wording of the conditions at the end. Right, so um, the application before you is a reserve matters application for the erection of four dwellings. Uh, the outline application was approved in 2020, where the access, scale, and layout were considered and approved. Therefore, this application is only considering the outstanding matters, which are appearance and landscaping. So just to give some context of the site, um, it's located on the southern side of Littlemore, uh, to the west of Canberra Road, which is just running along here, and then to the north of Darwin Close. Darwin Close is just here, and this is the site obviously here. It's currently an overgrown piece of vacant land. 
Uh, the land is landlocked, as you can see here, on three sides by existing housing. So the only entrance into the site is from the south across a communal parking area. Um, because the amended plan is so large, I've broken it down and I'll be um, showing it in more detail over the next five slides. The layout um, that was approved at the outline stage was the four dwellings, which you can see here, orientated in this east-west formation. They've also been slightly staggered, which picks up on the formation of the other um, dwellings in the surrounding streets. The properties all have rear gardens with some areas for planting at the front. Um, in relation to the layout and access, we received some comments from the highways team on this current application regarding the pipe the cycle provision and inclusive mobility. As this was the reserve matters application, we are unable to condition these issues. However, the agent has provided this amended plan, uh, which has included the cycle parking for each property. Um, they've also changed the access. So the cycle parking is uh, the cycle parking for each property here. They have also changed the access for each of the properties. We've got low gradient steps here and here, and these two um, accesses are um, ramped accesses. They've also included this tactile paving so that people with um, visual impairment would be able to um, navigate the, the site more easily. The agent has also indicated that there would be a safe passage for visual or mobility impaired persons along the footpath until it abuts the site, then they could cross the green hatched area and, uh, and access the properties. All of these issues have therefore erased, um, addressed highways concerns. So we'll just move on to some ground floor and first floor plans. You... Oh. Um, sorry, I think Councillor Hyde. Yeah, sorry, Chairman, I, I can't follow what Councillor Hyde. Oh, sorry, I'll change it. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Shall I go back to the previous slide so I can, no, okay. Um, so the proposed ground floor and first floor plans are showing three, uh, four three bedroom properties. And then this is on to the elevations. So whilst the scale, scale and layout were approved at the outline stage, the appearance is for consideration under this current scheme. Um, the elevations show the properties would reflect the character and proportions of the surrounding residential development. The properties would be constructed using buff brick and interlocking tiles, which reflect and harmonize with nearby properties. They've also included solar panels on the southern elevation to um, maximize solar gain. Uh, this is just an east-west elevation showing the slight fall in the ground levels across the site. So a landscaping is the other matter for considerations part of this application. The proposals do include the loss of the existing vegetation on the site. However, this is a very overgrown and currently has very little amenity value. The scheme therefore includes um, some typical ornamental planting, some species friendly planting, and some areas of uh, wildflower grass richlands, um, which are here. And there's also some um, replacement tree planting because we, are, we will be losing two very substandard trees on the site. So on to some photographs. Um, as the site is landlocked on the three sides and overgrown, access to the site is restricted. So I have limited photographs. However, this is the access to the site. So it goes across this communal car parking area. This is an aerial photograph of the site showing how overgrown it is but you can also see this is the communal parking area and it will be accessed from the south. Again, this shows a wider sort of view of the area and here is looking north towards Darwin Close so you can see the staggered formation and the um, buff bricks and the interlocking tiles and where they've taken reference for the design of the properties from. So um, as stated, the access scale and layout were fully reviewed and deemed satisfactory at the outline stage. So we're only looking at the um, appearance and landscaping um, the proposed dwellings would reflect the character and proportions and materials of the dwellings in the western end of Canberra Coast and Darwin Close, and would be in keeping with the wider estate as a whole. The um, dwellings have been designed in such a way as to prevent any adverse impact on residential amenity to nearby properties with sufficient distancing and no side-facing windows. Um, the existing trees and vegetation would be removed prior to the development. However, the area is overgrown and currently the vegetation has little amenity value. The proposed 
scheme includes provision of a variety of planting with native wildland species, areas of wildflower grassland, and some additional planting to replace those trees that have been lost. Uh, therefore, the recommendation is to grant permission subject to the conditions, but as I said, due to the amended plan, the wording of conditions two, three, and four has been amended to reflect this amended plan, um, and the wording of those conditions is on the screen now. So, the recommendation is to grant permission subject to the amended conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. We have no speakers on this item, no public speakers, so... It's open for member dis and discussion and any questions that you may have. Councillor Pipe. Councillor Pipe, Lichit Subaptum. Does the access road and, and the communal parking area, does that belong to the, to the developer? It falls within the red line. Um, they haven't, um, we're not, the, the area is a communal parking area and it falls within the red line, so there would be access across it. Councillor Pipe. So, so there's likely to be no, no problem gaining access uh, once these dwellings are, are up here. Uh, yeah, Chair, thank you. Um, I understand you might be concerned, but we're not actually here to consider access. We can literally only consider the appearance and the landscaping because the principle of the development, it's access, it's siting and it's scale have already all been approved. So we can only consider appearance and landscaping. Councillor Ireland. I propose we accept the recommendation of the officer. Councillor Weller. So we have a proposer and a seconder. Councillor Williams, did you want to say something? No, you're okay. So we have a proposer, we have a seconder. If we could have the recommendation on the screen, please, because the wording has changed slightly. Are you all content with this revised wording? Yeah. So if we can go to the vote then, please. Vote to approve. So committee have voted to approve this recommendation and plan. Thank you. We'll now move on to item 5C, which is item number P stroke FUL stroke 2023 stroke 01319, Bonscombe Farm, Bonscombe Lake Lane, Shipton Gorge, Dorset, DT6 4LJ. And this is going to be introduced by Charlotte Loveridge. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Chair. Okay, as um, already mentioned, this is for Bonscombe Farm, Bonscombe Lane at Shipton Gorge in Dorset for the conversion and change of use of an existing agricultural building to holiday let accommodation. So this shows a Okay. Councillor Pipe.
Uh, we're just waiting for a member to come back to the chamber to take part in item 5C. If I can remind members, we are still live. Thank you, Councillor Pipe. Okay, Councillor Leary is now back in the chamber and if we could start the presentation again, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is an application for Bonscombe Farm, Bonscombe Lane in Shipton Gorge in Dorset for the conversion of a change of use of an existing agricultural building to holiday let accommodation. Uh, this is a site location plan. The red triangle here indicates the site, um, which is in an isolated position in open countryside outside of the settlement of Shipton Gorge, which can be seen to the southeast here. Walditch um, settlement is further to the northwest. And um, the, settle, uh, the holding that um, the barn belongs to is Bonscombe Farm, where the main house and additional buildings are just here to the northeast of the site. This is um, the site plan of the uh, proposed piggery conversion. It shows the access track, which would come in from uh, one of the lanes from Shipton Gorge. Uh, the access track has been uh, granted through a, an agricultural prior approval notification in 2020, which also includes the erection of an agricultural building on the hard standing area directly um, forward of the piggery building. Uh, both the track and the agricultural building have yet to be constructed. Um, and it's understood that if the this application is approved, then they may try, um, uh, they may decide to try and recite the agricultural building. This shows an aerial view of the site, um, which again gives um, a sense of its isolation. The building sits on a level area of ground um, where the land gently slopes away to the northeast out to an open vista with views towards Egnan Hill, uh, which is just under four miles away. The site is surrounded by agricultural land. Um, as I say, the closest, uh, the edge of development in Shipton Gorge is uh, the close known as Rockway, um, about half a kilometre to the east. Uh, you can also see the strip linchets um, just to the north of the site here. Uh, this is a closer view of the site, which was um, Google Earth says was in June of this year. This is the building in question here. This is the hard standing where there was previously a building and is the proposed site for the agricultural building under the prior notification. The site is within the Dorset AOMB. It's within the Powerstock Hills landscape character area, which um, is noted for having an undeveloped character with impressive views from largely open hilltops. Um, and is associated with tranquility, remoteness, and dark night skies. The site is bounded by um, mature hedgerows um, and some trees on uh, mature trees uh, close to it. This is a plan of the existing building, um, which shows the uh, sort of concrete block work with concrete render with a cement fibre sheet roofing. Um, 
Uh, the footprint is approximately five meter by 19.5 meters um, and is probably about 50 years old, mid 20th century. These are photos of the existing building. Um, it's not considered to be of any particular visual merit. Um, it's not a traditional vernacular stone farm building um, that the area can be known for. The structural report for the building um, has stated that it is capable of conversion, although there's no details as to whether there's actually any foundations um, or what the details of the foundations of the building are. Um, as I say, not of any architectural or historical merit. Um, and these show other views um, from the southwest and northwestern end of the building. So the proposal is um, to convert to um, a holiday let. Um, this would include increasing the roof height by approximately 0.65 meters, uh, creating extensive door and window openings and adding a largely glazed porch on the front uh, north eastern elevation. Um, and the design gives little reference to its former um, agricultural building use. Um, it, it, you know, it loses a sense of agrarian um, aesthetic about it um, and is more similar to a park home dwelling that you'd find in a suburban location. Here um, is the existing and proposed site plans side by side, obviously the aerial photo of the existing. Um, this is the proposed site um, which would have a gravel uh, driveway to the front, parking areas to the side of the building and bin stores on the other side, um, and a terraced deck area with garden behind it. Um, I mean, the building is considered at present to be relatively innocuous, um, which creates relatively you know, little visual harm as it sits unobtrusively on the site. Um, and is the sort of building you'd expect to see in the countryside, uh, whereas this proposal will then, you know, create a gravel driveway, parking area, bins and the general, general paraphernalia uh, that would be uncharacterist uncharacteristically sort of over-refurbishment and residential within the open countryside. This is a view from uh, the public right-of-way which runs to the south of the site. Um, you can just see the roof of the building poking out above the hedgeway at the moment, um, which, as I say, is consistent with the rural aesthetic as an agrarian building um, and considered to be in keeping with its rural surroundings. The footpath that runs to the south uh, comes from Burbit Lane, which is off the west side of Shipton Gorge and carries on towards uh, Walditch and Bothenhampton. So the main issues are the principle of development. Um, whilst there are the various policies that support the principle of the adaptations, it is sub subject to being within keeping of the rural character. Uh, the scale design impact on character and appearance. Again, policy SUS3 supports the adaptation and reuse of rural buildings if the existing building makes a positive contribution to local character, and if their proposed form, bulk, and design will make a positive contribution to the local character. Policy EMV 10 states development should be informed by the character of the site and its surroundings, whilst EMV 12 requires siting alignment design, scale mass and materials to complement and respect the surroundings and be in, in harmony with the area as a whole. Um, the proposal is considered to be con contrary to these three policies. So with the impact on the landscape um, within the Dorset AOMB and landscape character area, um, the proposed conversion is in an isolated position in open countryside, and it's considered the development would harm the character, special qualities and natural beauty, as well as the sense of tranquility and remote remoteness of the Dorset AOMB, uh, contrary to the local plan policies and also paragraphs 176 and 178 of the MPPF. 
Um, it would not make a positive contribution to the character of the countryside with the public right of way and would detract from the quality of views and sense of remoteness and tranquility from the public right of way that passes to the south of the site. Um, there would be a limited addition to the rural economy, um, but it, the proposal is contrary to the National Planning Policy Framework, paragraph 84C, as it is not considered to be sustainable rural development which respects the character of the countryside. Um, there are other matters which uh, are considered to accord with policies such as neighbouring amenity, flooding in the site, biodiversity and ecology, and access and parking. So with policy SUS3, which is for the adaptation and reuse of buildings outside defined development boundaries, the supporting text for this policy says, it is, however, important to consider whether the building is worthy of retention in terms of its structure and how it contributes to local character, the impact on the surroundings that may arise from the changes necessary to enable its reuse. Um, there is some concern about how much of the original fabric of the building would be left if the roof will be uh, raised. The northwestern walls would be mo moved out by just over half a metre, um, a large opening three metres wide in the northeast elevation for a glazed porch, along with extensive window and glazed door openings um, and bifold doors. Uh, there was a Mid-Suffolk mid appeal for a Class Q, which is um, Conversion of Agricultural Buildings, proposal that stated um, of a scheme that they considered. Consequently, very little of the existing building would be utilised, and I consider this to go beyond a conversion and would be considered reasonably necessary for the building starting afresh with only a modest amount of help from the original. Uh, paragraph 80 of the MPPF also supports conversions in isolated locations if it represents the optimal viable use of a heritage asset, which this isn't considered to be a heritage asset. Um, if the reuse of a redundant building would enhance its immediate setting, which again, we don't consider that it would, or if the design is of exceptional quality, including significantly enhance, enhancing its media area and being sensitive to the defining characters characteristics of the local area, which again, we don't consider that this proposal achieves. So with regards to the scale design impact on character and appearance and visual amenity, uh, back in November last year, there was an appeal decision on the old milking barn at Betiscombe, which was also for uh, the conversion of a redundant agricultural building, which was also of a similar uh, concrete block and render design. The inspector noted on this appeal decision that the appeal building is in gently sloping and attractive countryside reflective of its AOMB designation. The existing block and render building is single storey with a monopitch roof and a small footprint has a utilitarian form that is clearly identifiable as having once been an agricultural use. A utilitarian appearance is not unusual for buildings in the countryside, but its form does not make a positive contribution to the character and appearance of the area. Moreover, the proposal would have the appearance of a modest wooden holiday chalet. As such, this design would have little relationship with that of its previous agricultural use, and nor would it particularly reflect the design of the buildings nearby. As a result, the domestic nature of its chalet form would appear out of place with the rural appearance of the area. Whilst it's acknowledged that this scheme obviously is different in that it's not proposing a wooden chalet um, design, um, it is relevant because obviously it's comparable because of the existing block and render style and the resulting absence of its previous agricultural use um, in the proposed design. Uh, the Betiscombe site was also um, close to other buildings and not in such an isolated position as well. Uh, with the impact on the landscape and the Dorset AOMB in the landscape character area, the MPPF paragraph 176 sets out that great weight should be given to conserving and enhancing landscape and scenic beauty in areas of outstanding natural beauty which have the highest status of protection in these, uh, relation to these areas. It's considered the building is separated physically and visually from the nearest surrounding properties and as such is relatively inaccessible. The building falls alone within an open level field 
is a lone building without surrounding contextual development. There are often expansive views across fields to distant hills and wooded horizons, notably northeastwards to Egerton Hill and east to Shipton Hill. Conversely, there are distant views into the site from these prominent areas. This is an extract from a Dorset AOMB viewpoint photo that's taken from Shipton Hill. The red uh, rectangle here shows the uh, site in question. On the right-hand side here, we have the buildings of Bonscombe Farm, and the access track would uh, go navigate around the hedgerows to the um, site. Um, and this picture gives a sense of the isolation of the site and the fact that it's not really related to any other buildings um, or settlement. This is a view on the site taken from the front elevation um, of the piggery, which go, views northeast uh, from the site. And you can see Egerton Hill in the background here. And you have got Shipton Hill just behind this um, hedgerow here. Um, with regards to the Dorset A and B and Powerstock Hills, uh, one of the characteristics of the Powerstock Hills landscape character area is its remoteness and dark night skies. Uh, the introduction of a residential dwelling in an area of undulating open countryside will result in a more conspicuous feature that is currently, than is currently the case. Once occupied, light pollution from the holiday unit could not be eradicated. Um, I mean, this would also include, obviously, traffic uh, using the trackways to and from the site because uh, private cars are probably the main use of transport in order to be able to get there. Um, again, the sense of tranquility from the public right of way, which appears to be uh, well used, this would be diminished if the building is converted to holiday accommodation and its associated views. And the views of the site, it's the views both into and out of the um, AOMB landscape that are relevant in terms of the visual effect on any development. Whether or not it can be seen by the public or if there is visual harm, does not necessarily mean that it can be regarded as not being harmful to the intrinsic character of the countryside. Uh, there are various uh, policies within the Dorset AOMB management plan that the proposal is contrary to. Um, the management plan supports development that conserves and enhances the AOMB. Development that does not conserve and enhance the AOMB will only be supported if it is necessary and in the public interest. Uh, which in this case is it's not considered to be. Policy C4A, remove existing and avoid creating new features which are detrimental to landscape character, tranquility in the AOMB special qualities. Um, and again, talks about views into and out of the AOMB um, and proposals that are harmful to the character will not be permitted unless there are benefits that clearly outweigh uh, the proposals which as I say, in this instance, we don't feel there is. Uh, so the recommendation is that the committee be minded to refuse for the following reasons, which I won't all read them all out, but essentially that the existing building is not considered worthy of retention as it has no visual agricultural or historical value um, and is contrary to a number of policies and will result in an intrinsic and unjustified landscape and visual harm, which will erode the sense of tranquility and remoteness within a sensitive location. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. And we have one speaker, Helen Benedict. And you have three minutes. Thank you. Yes, I'm Helen Benedict and live at Bonscombe Farm. Bonscombe Farm is an agricultural holding which benefits from past farm diversification. In 2004, a holiday let unit was granted consent and its income has since been instrumental in cross-subsidising our farm by replacing withdrawn government subsidies and paying for higher operational costs. Conversion of the redundant piggery, located just 300 metres from our own farmhouse, um, would further cross-fund the business and is supported by both local and national policies. A positive pre-application meeting was undertaken in 2019, 
whereby the planning officer at the time deemed the conversion of the building acceptable in principle, and as noted in the current planning officer's report, he was enthused about a positive outcome. It is relevant to note that at the time of the pre-app, the site was still located within the AOMB and the same local plan applies. The building itself is of permanent and substantial construction, can easily be converted through typical conversion works, and as the case of mentions, is largely well screened from wider views by dense boundary vegetation. The application has not received any objections, but rather a strong letter of support from our parish council, Shipton Gorge, and a positive response from our ward member. We have no intention of reciting um, the newly approved barn. A key point of refusal is the impact of the building on the AOMB. The site is positioned as well contained and is not significantly visible from the wider landscape views. Whilst the ridge height will be raised marginally, the building will not become significantly more visible and could, could not reasonably be considered harmful to the AOMB. The case officer often mentions the impact from lighting on dark night skies as a reason for refusal. Car headlights will be infrequent, external lighting is not proposed, and any light emitting through windows will not shine upwards. Light pollution will not be presented. Dorset Council recently approved a development less than four miles away from us for, for the erection of five new um, build holiday units. It's difficult to understand this also lies in AOMB, how the conversion of a well-contained existing farm building can be so harmful to AOMB. <laughs> Finally, in terms of the appearance of the building, several attempts were made to engage with the planning officer on this matter for guidance, but no advice or dialogue was given. In summary, the Piggery is a redundant agricultural building that could be effectively used to contribute to the local community and economy and cross-build the income of our farm. The building is structurally sound and can be easily converted. The site is well contained and screened, so the impact on the NOB will be minimal. The application has received no objections and is importantly supported by our parish council and the ward member. We would ask the committee to support this application as the benefits far outweigh the negatives. Thank you very much. Respond to any comments that have been made, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, with regards to the pre-application advice, this was uh, back in 2018 with the site visit done in 2019 by a colleague with mine, and it is acknowledged that they did accept, uh, in principle, that you know there there was a um, possibility that this could be. Um, converted. However, unfortunately, there wasn't a written response given to this, so I had no written record on which to go by. And having discussed it with them in the course of this application, uh, they did note that obviously, you know, whilst they might have been enthusiastic about the proposal in general, um, it was subject to all the normal policy considerations, um, which is you know, what has been assessed during the course of this um, application. Um, with regards to um, the designs in external lighting, um, even if there's no external lighting, internal lighting will um, obviously, you know, be visible within, within the uh, open landscape there. Um, and so it is, it's the noise, the disruption, and just the general change of character of the isolated um, and basically undeveloped countryside, which would then become a domestic dwelling, essentially, within that setting, uh, which is not considered to be appropriate in our view. Um, and obviously, since 2018, 2019, with the pre-application proposal, there have been um, subsequent um, appeal decisions made, which again also have a bearing on um, our considerations of this proposal. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you uh, for that, Charlotte. So we now come to discussion by members. And if you could remember, you can ask questions and discuss. If you could remember to say your name, please. Would anyone like to start with yourself? Councillor Williams. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sarah Williams, Bridport Ward. Can you remind me what the um, roof heights difference is going to be, please? No. Members, could we let the officers answer, please? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, about 0.65 metres increase in height. Are you happy with that, Councillor Williams? Yeah. Um, very, thank you. Not very much, in other words. <laughs> Councillor Ireland. Uh, uh, yeah, OK. Um, I don't know if we're on debate or technical. Uh, sort of the change the structure I've made. Um, so I do have a question, um, and I guess you may take it from it where I might, might be going. Um, is it possible if we went against the offer recommendation and we said it, we could, this is possible to convert, can we condition that it would be permanent, a permanent holiday let and not for domestic use, you know, full-time occupation? Uh, yes, we could, yeah. You happy with that, Councillor Ireland? You wish to speak again? Yes, I will speak again. Um, I'm, I'm sort of on the fence for this one. Um, I've got to go on one side. I have no. So I, I, I actually think we, sh we should go against the officer's recommendation. Um, I don't think it's a huge impact on the environment. It is screened rather well. The lighting is an issue for me, and I think if we went forward, we'd have to condition that there is no external lighting at all. And anything else that can be applied relating to dark skies, standards, or wherever they are, should be, if that makes sense. But I, I think we should accept the development and go against the officer's um, proposal. Councillor Anne, do you have a seconder? Councillor Pipe. Upset. I'm quite happy to propose, second that proposal, Madam Chairman. Now, you've gone against the officer's recommendation, so we're back where we were to, uh, a couple of um, applications ago. You have to come up with your reasons. You have to give solid planning reasons, and the officers will get the wording correct. So I, um, I look forward to your planning reasons. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm going to say where I think, and whether this is actually valid or not. I, I think the, the economic benefits outweigh the, the, um, the, the negatives. I don't think it has a huge impact on the AOMB. The AOMB is huge. It's screened. It is close to the farmhouse. I, yeah, light. I think the only issue I have is light, but I think that can be mitigated pretty much. Thank you, Councillor Ireland. Um, Anne, would you be? Are you able to give some direction on this? Some wording. So, so I suppose as I'm hearing it, you consider the economic benefits, the provision of one additional unit of holiday accommodation outweighs what you seem to consider to be the limited visual impacts on the O&B, having regard to the screening of the site. Um, obviously, we could condition that there be no external lighting. Um, we can't really go much further than that in terms of lighting because... We don't really have control over what somebody does internally and there's going to be windows. And so, you know, as officers advise, there would be an impact on dark skies in that respect. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the sort of policy stance is that just because something has an economic benefit, that doesn't necessarily make it acceptable. 
um, you know, the policies about the building being worthy of retention and being able to be converted, um, but presumably members are looking to approve it. I think that is the case, but perhaps we just need some clarity over that, Chair. Uh, Councillor Ireland, we're asking for clarity. To be honest, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, it is a building. It, there is a carbon cost, obviously, if you knock it down. It can be reused. Uh, I know it's, I don't think it should be ever be used for, as a domestic dwelling. I think it should be purely for holiday let. The applicant already has indicated they have a holiday let, a successful holiday let, which contributes to their business and supports the business. And we should be sporting, sporting rural businesses, especially in times like this. So I, I, I don't see the issue. I, you know, you could you could tart the building up quite a bit um, potentially you could put cladding on and that sort of thing um you know all of us watch grand designs well okay I mean, <laughs> councillor pipe doesn't um i i don't see any, i don't have an issue with it and you know i'm i'm looking to our professionals to to actually you know provide reasons why we can do this and i i couldn't remember from the picture of the, the the building if it had roof lights in. Um, if it does, they probably should, we probably don't want them. But um, I don't think there were, and we probably should probably condition that there aren't. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ireland. Councillor Pipe, did you want to? Yes, please, Madam Chairman. Councillor Bill Pipe, Lichardson Upton. The economic benefits of of the conversion of, of the piggery. Uh, would not benefit the, the local local area that much, but the the thing that it would benefit would would be the the the, the, the farmer uh, the, if it's if that's the lady who spoke earlier, um, and, and I think we should be in the business of supporting uh, local uh, very like small landowners like like the lady who spoke if she is. Uh, the, the the farmer and I, and I and I really do think that we should uh, uh, go ahead and uh, have a look at have a look at um, how we how we can um, fit this into an acceptable form form of words, but particularly where as has already been said there there is no impact on on the environment. There, there are no neighbours apart from the, the farmer and his, her family, and I think it has merit. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pipe. Councillor Cocking. Could, could we put in something that is it repurposing an existing building? And um, I believe the lady did say that, I think it was about four miles away, that there was already that was approved um, four or five holiday homes within an a a n o an a n o b so perhaps that was set a precedent um, and I don't think it would do much harm but you're making use of an existing building they're not actually knocking it down completely and rebuilding a new building they are repurposing an existing building. Councillor Cocking, Councillor Pipe. That's a bill pipe still at the Lichets and Upton. Uh, my colleague has, has just pointed out that precedent has been set, albeit four miles away, um, and I think that should be taken into consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments, queries? No? Chair. Yes, Anne. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've heard what members said. It's clear that they the two that have, well, the several that have spoken consider the um, sort of economics benefits to outweigh any visual impacts and on the basis of it being a conversion of this existing building sort of under policy econ eight and econ six that seems to be the basis to support it i just want members to be clear that they're not relying on something that's happened four miles away um for which we have no details in front of us today um you know we're very clear here that things don't set a precedent and members just need to be mindful of that and might want to uh, kind of come back on that um, because that would not be a basis for approving this. Members, you have to disregard the precedent set four miles away. It has to take no part 
in your decision making. Are you content to do that? So you have to, it has been mentioned a couple of times and you have to disregard that. Are you content to do that? Thank you. And would you like a short, we're going to adjourn now for 10 minutes. Thank you.
Off again, Louis. Right, so um, we have the revised proposal in front of you. Have you all read it, and are you content with it? Oh, um, Anne, could you go through it and explain all the changes, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so... The proposal, based on hearing what members have said today and our suggested um, suggestions as officers, is to delegate authority to the Head of Planning and the Service Manager for Development and Man Management and Enforcement to grant planning permission, subject to a Section 106 to tie the development to the agriculture holdings such that they cannot be sold separately, because I think what members have said to me today is that this is kind of considered as an, um, an economic benefit in terms of its firm farm diversification scheme. So it's important to link that unit of holiday accommodation back to that agricultural holding and that benefit you perceive in terms of the impact for the holding. And subject to planning conditions, the detailed wording of which will first have been agreed by the vice chair, who's acting as the chairman today, to cover the following matters. So the conditions would be um, a three-year implementation of the planning permission, standard condition, a plans list, um, clarification that permission is for conversion and not for rebuild, and the submission and approval of a method statement to enable the conversion of the building, that the building should be used for holiday accommodation use only, and a register should be kept to those staying there, approval of material samples, remove permitted development rights, for once it's been constructed for new windows, openings, roof lights, extensions and outbuildings. Um, that's really intended to control the longer term visual impact and having regard to comments from members about dark skies, etc. A condition requiring no external lighting, an implementation of biodiversity mitigation plan, which we already have on file, the submission and implementation of a soft landscaping scheme and its ongoing maintenance for five years, the provision of the turning and parking area prior to first use, as shown on the approved plans, and details of proposed boundary treatments, including materials and height, and that they be retained as such thereafter. Um, the context very much for those conditions as our standard conditions, hearing what members say about it only being used for holiday accommodation, and really controlling um, the visual impact, particularly in the longer term, um, given its location within the OMB. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ireland, are you happy with the revised conditions and recommendation? Yeah, um, I think it cap encapsulates everything. And thank you to the officers for coming up with such a comprehensive list of recommendations. Uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> conditions, I should say, not recommendations. Thank you. Councillor Pipe, are you happy with the proposed recommendation and conditions. Absolutely, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else want to speak or have any questions or queries or comments before we go to the vote? No? OK, then. So. 
We can now go to the vote on this new recommendation, which is to grant planning permission and the list of um, the conditions. So all those who are in favor of the recommendation to grant. Any opposed or any? You're opposed. Well, one opposed. Any abstentions? Thank you, committee. That has been approved for the, the Piggery building. Thank you. We now go on to item 5D, P stroke HOU stroke 2023 stroke 03047, 73 Woolcombe Road, Portland. DT 52JA, which will be introduced by Katrina Trevitt. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Chair. So yes, planning permission has been applied for, and I stress this, to erect a single story front extension and bike shed to the side of the front garden at number 73 Walcombe Road, Portland. And you'll understand why I've stressed what's been applied for as we go through the presentation. So um, the application site is situated to the west of Western Road within Western in Portland. Uh, which you can see under the red line area here. It's one of a terrace and it's situated on the end, the eastern end of, of a terrace. Here is the site location, the block plan basically, although this doesn't show the entire rear garden, which is also falls within the red line area. But what it does show is the hook type front garden area that belongs to the existing property and just reflected on plan again. And so this scheme seeks, um, it, it's partially retrospective in that the metal bike shed, which is uh, greyed out on this plan, is already in situ. And they seek to erect a single storey uh, front porch type extension on the front of the dwelling, which is shown in purpley pink. Here's the existing elevations showing the metal shed within that kind of hook area um, to the side of, of the dwelling within the front garden. And here's the proposed elevations showing the retained metal shed and the proposed single store extension on the frontage. Here's some photos just to reflect on the metal shed that's in situ at the moment and to show the, the uh, proposed, well, the existing front elevation where the proposed single store extension is to be situated. You can see here um, the metal shed, its situation just within that kind of hook part of the, uh, of the front garden. And members will probably notice the two meter wall that goes to the rear of the metal shed. Here's just some examples of other uh, curtilage um, building sheds that have been erected in, in various front garden areas in the vicinity. Um, we do acknowledge that there's several examples of this types of building pepper potted throughout the estate, although we recognize that uh, not many of them are actually, tim uh, are actually metal. They tend to be more, more timber examples. Um, however, we do consider that the metal uh, shed at the moment is well scaled, it's low, its impact is, is low um, and is therefore considered acceptable to be retained. This is just to point out that there are other um, front single store extensions uh, on existing dwellings also pepper potted throughout the surrounding estate and actually what's proposed on the front elevation of the application site Sorry, I will just change my point, I've just realised that. Um, 
bear with me a minute. Uh, there we go. Uh, within the application site here will basically reflect what's been done next door. So precedent is set in that regard. Here's just the existing floor plan. Uh, so you can see the store there at the moment. And then this is the proposed floor plan with that front single store extension added in. So the key considerations in terms of this scheme, there is principal support for the erection of extensions and curtilage buildings within uh, dwellings generally under the adopted local plan. The design of both the extension and the metal shed are considered um, acceptable in terms of visual amenity of the street scene. As I've shown, there's various examples um, and they're very uh, modest and low in terms of their scale an appearance. It's intended that the front single store extension will have matching materials to the uh, original dwelling. Another key consideration of this is neighbouring amenity, and this is the point uh, raised in terms of the two metre high wall. Um, I want to be clear that this is not for the members' consideration today because this is actually permitted development, and the householder has um, implemented their permitted development right to erect a two metre wall to the rear of the bike shed um, in terms uh, when asked to windproof the existing bike shed and also for security and privacy. But as the members can see, it is situated in front of the neighbour's uh, front-facing kitchen window. Um, unfortunately, this is probably a reflection on when planning permission was granted for these two relatively new build dwellings to the side of this property here in that the case officer um, obviously did not reflect on the permitted development rights of this property and uh, clearly didn't assume that this type of occurrence would happen. However, we are not here to consider the two metre high wall. It's purely the, um, the uh, shed in situ and the front single story extension. Now, obviously in terms of impact on this neighbour, um, that wall does completely screen the bike shed from view. If the wall were not there, we would still consider that the bike shed is set far enough forward, far enough in, um, and is so low um, that the impact would actually be acceptable. Um, if we were considering planning permission for that wall, then we'd likely have concerns with it, given its proximity to the neighbour but we're not, we're considering the bike shed and the extension only. You can see a picture from, uh, we've had um, permission to show this picture from the neighbor, but you can see the two meter high wall from the internal of their, of their kitchen there. So we are looking to grant planning permission for the shed and for the front single story extension on the basis that the design, general visual impact, scale, materials, appearance are acceptable. There's precedent set within the area. Um, there's not considered to be any significant harm to neighboring residential amenity from the port and or the single story extension and bike shed only. Um, and there's no material considering, uh, considerations which would warrant refusal of this application. Therefore, we're looking to grant subject conditions with the three-year time limit, the planned list, but also removing permitted development rights for any windows or openings in the bike shed in the occurrence that that wall is subsequently removed. I will just reflect on the fact that um, the wall, we could not um, insist that that wall was removed or reduced in height at all. That's not what we're considering um, and the householder, as I've said, has invoked their permitted development right to have a wall at that height within the curtilage of their building and set back from the highway. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Katrina. Oh. Uh, thank you, Katrina. Sorry. We have no speakers on this. So it's um, open to discussion to committee members, discussion and questions. Councillor Cocking. Um, I have to be really careful. Um, how, how big, because obviously I went round and had a look at it because it's on my ward. Um, and the, the size of the shed, 
How is there a legal requirement? Because you said a lot of the sheds there are, are, are timber and this one is metal, and which I know is, is no, no difference technically. Um, I assume that there's no technical difference between a metal and a timber shed. But is there, is there a size limit for a shed to be built? Um, or can they just build a shed as big as they want? Is my question. I mean, obviously, there's permitted development rights which do allow for um, certain curtilage buildings to be erected within the curtilage of dwelling houses up to a certain scale and distance from boundaries, etc. Um, the fact is, is that this shed requires planning permission because it's set forward of the dwelling and and its kind of presence in the street scene. Um, and therefore, we are considering whether it's, its scale and appearance is acceptable as part of this, this planning application. And so therefore, it's for the members to consider if they feel it is appropriately scaled um, and finished in terms of what you've been shown today. And obviously, the various examples that I've, I've shown in those photographs as part of the presentation. Are you content with that, Councillor Cocking? To me, it is a very large shed. It's more like a garage, um, and it's, it doesn't blend in at all. Um, it's just very obtrusive, very large. So that's, that's, just, that's my issue with it. it is, it's not a shed. It's not a bike shed. It is a garage. Do you have any comment to make? I acknowledge your opinion um, about that. Councillor Pipe. Councillor Pipe, Lichester and Upton. Uh, the, the tin shed or metal shed, whatever you want to call it, it is not, in my opinion, any larger than uh, a small garden shed, quite frankly. Um, and we've heard that it fits in with scale. Uh, there's, there's no objection by council officers to it being made of metal. And uh, I, I think uh, I'd like to propose that we go to the vote on this, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Pipe. So you are proposing, proposing accepting the officer's recommendation. Councillor O'Leary. Uh, thank you, Chairman. It's delightful to actually take part in this meeting. Um, I would like to second uh, Councillor Pipe, please. We'd like to second that you accept the officer's recommendation. Yes, Chairman. Thank, thank you, Councillor O'Leary. Would anyone else like to make any comments or ask any questions? Right, we have a proposer, we have a seconder to accept the officer's recommendation. So I'd like a show of hands, please. Who is in favor of the officer's recommendation? Thank you. And who is against? One. And any abstentions? I did, I did. Well, then I'll put myself down as an abstention. So the recommendation is carried. And um, thank you very much for your attendance this morning. Much appreciated. Uh, we're not quite got to the end. I do need to read out urgent items. Item number six, there are no urgent items. And item number seven, exempt business, there is no exempt business. So I now declare the meeting closed and thank you all very much for your attendance. <laughs>